Hello and welcome to your number one tech show. A lot is in store for you, including a discussion on compliance of data regulations, which Grace Githaiga will be taking us through later on in Tech Talk. But before that, we'll be keeping you, bringing you up to speed in tech news, both locally and internationally. The hashtag to use is Tech on Tech at KBC Channel One. My name is Stephanie Ayeta. We love interacting with you and that's why we have the question of the day so that we can hear your opinion. And today's question, we are asking you, what sector in Kenya do you feel needs technological innovation to be invested in it in order to advance it? Talk to us. The hashtag to use is Tech on Tech at KBC Channel One. In tech news, the Communication Authority of Kenya designates the number 100 as the uniform number to be used by all telcos in Kenya, among many other conditions that has been set that have been set by the authority. And internationally, the U.S. midterm elections are coming up, and TikTok is set to teach in its influencers on how to uh, behave during the electioneering period to avoid spread of misinformation. This and much more in our tech news program. The Communication Authority of Kenya is compelling telcos to do more in terms of customer service. This is through the recently published Customer Protection Guidelines and Customer Care Standards by the ICT Regulator. The set standards, which are aligned with the Kenya Information and Communication Regulations 2010, will become effective 12 months from the date of the issue, that is from July 2023. All licensees have been asked to establish customer care systems which will ensure that facilities and systems provided for the purpose are more than enough to address customer concerns when such services are needed. The regulation states that all network facility providers and mobile virtual network operators must designate the number 100 as their customer care number. The number is also supposed to work for roaming customers in East Africa. Customer care facilities must not place an undue burden on subscribers, including customers with disabilities, based on the cost of accessing such services and how far they should travel to access a physical customer care shop. The Communication Authority is also compelling telcos that customer care services must be available 99.9% .9 of the time. 80% of all customer care calls must be answered within 20 seconds. This includes the waiting time where automated voices or ads are used to manage call queues. The Communication Authority advises that a telco must acknowledge a complaint to the customer within one working day. The complaint must also be addressed in less than 21 days. The guidelines have been put in place to clarify how the authority expects licensed service providers to respect and protect consumers' rights and encourage best practices by licensed service providers and promote the provision of high-quality services to customers. TikTok says it will work to prevent content creators from posting paid political messages on the short-form video app as part of its preparation for the U.S. midterm election in November, which will see many governor, senate, and congressional contests. Critics and lawmakers accuse TikTok and rival social media companies including Meta platforms and Twitter of doing too little to stop political misinformation and divisive content from spreading on their apps. 
While TikTok has banned paid political ads since 2019, campaign strategists have skirted the ban by paying influencers to promote political issues. The company seeks to close the loophole by hosting briefings with creators and talent agencies to remind them that posting paid political content is against TikTok's policies. TikTok's head of US safety added that internal teams, including those that work on trust and safety, will monitor for signs that creators are being paid to post political content. And the company will also rely on media reports and outside partners to find violating posts. Meta, which owns Facebook and Instagram, said it will restrict political advertisers from running new ads a week before the election, an action it also took in 2020. Twitter said it planned to revive previous strategies for the midterm election, including placing labels in front of some misleading tweets and inserting reliable information into timelines to debunk false claims before they spread further online. Have you ever lost your luggage in an airport? Well, if you haven't, then you're lucky. If you have, you don't have to fear anymore because technology has come to solve this problem. In Tech of the Week, we feature different technologies aiming to prevent the loss of airline luggage. Here it goes. Newspaper headlines and social media posts around the world have shown in recent months that missing air luggage is far from a unique problem. One insurance firm, Spain's Murphy, said that the number of passengers reporting missing luggage this summer was 30% higher than in 2019, the last year of normal travel before the pandemic. While no global estimates are yet available for the volume of delayed or lost luggage so far this year, data from 2019 shows that the problem has always existed. That year, 19 million bags and suitcases were late arriving around the world and 1.3 million were never seen again, according to an annual report by CETA, a provider of baggage management software. A victim of airline luggage loss as featured by BBC scrolled through her photos of her 40th birthday celebration in Greece, knowing that much of the clothes and jewelry she had worn in that picture are lost for good. Two months later, an EasyJet had has confirmed that her luggage has been permanently lost. To try keep tabs on their items of luggage, a growing number of passengers are now turning to technology. Apple has reportedly seen a rise in sales of its AirTag tracking device. The AirTag works by sending out a secure Bluetooth signal that can be detected by nearby devices in the Find My Network. These devices send the AirTag's location to the iCloud, allowing the user to go to the Find My app and see see it on the map. In other words, you can see exactly where your missing suitcase is via your smartphone or computer. See True is another company that hopes to help airports and airlines get luggage onto planes more efficiently in the first place. The Israeli firm makes software that can do security scans on check-in luggage much faster than human security staff. For a UK tech firm airporter, its approach to tackling the problem is to remove the need for passengers to have to queue up at the airport to check in their luggage before their flight. Instead, passengers can use its app and website to arrange for their luggage to be taken door to door. Currently available for British Airways and Swiss International Airlines flights between London and Geneva, an airport worker will pick up a person's suitcase from their home. This driver will then take it to the departure airport's luggage area in the bowels of the terminal building for check-in rather than going into the departure lounge. Then, at the destination airport, one of airport's transportation partners will pick up the suitcases and deliver them to the person's destination address. Airport's chief security Randall Darby set up the farm in 2013, saying he was so frustrated that baggage was traveling in the same way we have done for almost a century of commercial aviation. His aim is to expand the service around the world, and rather than just aiming it at business travelers, he hopes for it to ultimately become a utility utility service used by all types of holiday makers.
that's about it from tech of the week and remember today's question we are asking you what sector in kenya needs technological innovation to be invested in it in order to advance it the hashtag is tech on tech at kbc channel one and now we move on to tech talk where grace kithaga will be joined by evans ikua to talk about compliance of data regulations here it goes Thank you so much, Stephanie, for that introduction of uh, the interview section of Tech on Tech, a, a weekly program that brings you tech issues and breaks them now down in an in a non-tech way. Now, today we are going to be focusing on the issue of privacy and data protection compliance. Uh, recently, the Office of the Data Commissioner uh, released uh, data compliance guidelines and this is what we want to understand and what are the implications for companies and in the studio to help us understand we have Evans Ikua uh, who is an ICT consultant and works a lot in areas of open source. Karibu sana Evans. Thank you so much Chris. Okay so straight away just tell us more about the, you know, the data compliance for companies as, um, as a stipulated in the guidelines. You know, what do the guidelines provide? Okay. Uh, thanks uh, once again, Grace. Uh, indeed, uh, we know how the Data Protection Act, which is our local uh, privacy law. And uh, what this means is that, as we keep saying, uh, the law is not a suggestion that everybody must comply to the law. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, in addition to that, we have recently uh, gotten the Office of the Data Commissioner uh, put in place. The office is now operationalized, and the Data Commissioner has now put in place the data uh, protection regulations as envisaged in the Act. And what the data protection regulations come in place to do is to help uh, uh, um, kind of uh, give more meaning to the law. The law is, is very straightforward about what organizations need to do. So the regulations come in and clarify how those th things need to be done. And uh, it is important to note that the law uh, uh, needs to be complied by everybody who processes or controls personal data, even if, that, if, even if it's an individual. Mm -hmm. So even before we go to the registration of the data controllers and data processors, of which the regulations have laid out mm -hmm. the criteria for registration, everybody needs to know that uh, whatever you do, if you are doing something regarding personal data, you have to comply to the law, mm -hmm. even if you do that at an individual level. Mm -hmm. So over and above that, uh, now we have the regulations that uh, talk about, uh, uh, or, uh, that set out uh, which companies need to be registered mm -hmm. as data controllers. Uh, we'll take a short break, and when we come back, he will tell us what is this uh, data impact assessment all about uh, yes. because uh, I think uh, companies also need to understand. Yes. All right. Okay. So you're watching uh, Tech on Tech, uh, the interview section. And in today's uh, um, interview, we are looking into the issue of privacy and data, uh, data protection compliance for organizations and companies. Uh, please continue following us on our social media handles. And that's at uh, KBC Channel 1 across all the handles, keep watching. You're watching Tech on Tech, the interview section, where we're discussing the issue of privacy and data uh, compliance for organizations and companies with uh, Evans Ikua. Now, before we went on a break, of course, you did give us an indication of what sort of companies mm. need to register as data uh, processors. Now, talk to us about the issue that you raised earlier. What is this uh, data impact assessment all about? Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks a lot uh, once again. Uh, as we said, uh, 
each organization needs to determine how they are going to comply because what the law lays out is uh, the requirements of the law and compliance is about meeting all the requirements of the law and the regulations. Uh, and one of the things that is very, very important is the data protection impact assessment. Now, the data protection impact assessment as one of the items that an organization needs to have in its compliance program because an organization will need to uh, lay out a compliance program, a program of activities and, and, and processes that they are going to put together to ensure they have complied to all the requirements. One of them is called the data protection impact assessment. And the data protection impact assessment uh, is a requirement for organizations that are processing particular large amounts of, uh, of, of personal data uh, and for organizations that are about to implement new projects that, uh, uh, that are going to, uh, to be requiring the, you know, um, uh, the, the control of large amounts of data. So the data protection impact assessment is basically a, a, a program that you put in place. It's a process that helps an organization to determine what kind of impact their processing activities are going to have on the owners of the data. Mm -hmm. So it is, a, in a way, it is a, it is a continuation of the risk assessment process that you normally find in information security. Mm -hmm. And uh, in risk assessment, you normally try to find out uh, what are the risks uh, that are going to affect your processing activities so that you can be able to put in controls uh, to manage or to mitigate those risks. Mm -hmm. And here you are talking about risks to your processing activities. Mm -hmm. So for instance, there can be a risk of data loss. Maybe you're traveling and you've lost your laptop and that laptop has personal data. There is a risk that that laptop can be stolen and that data can fall in the wrong hands mm -hmm. where the data is exposed. <laughs> inadvertently. So as a continu continuation of that uh, process, there is the data protection impact assessment. Mm -hmm. Now we, we want to go a step further and assess the impact to the data subjects if that data was to fall in the wrong hands. Mm -hmm. For instance, if it is a laptop that belongs to a doctor, and in that laptop there is a lot of diagnosis information about patients. So what kind of impact would that have if that laptop is lost and the data is stolen and falls in the wrong hand mm -hmm. and probably it's publicized, what impact will that have on the, on, on the data owners or the data subjects? Mm -hmm. So that once you determine what kind of impact you will have, then you're able to determine what kind of uh, uh, controls you're going to put around that mm -hmm. so that you can be able to protect mm -hmm. uh, 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 and control those risks so okay. that they don't happen and then you don't have now those impacts happening on the, on the owners of the data. Okay. Uh, and what are the implications of not uh, complying with, uh, you know, this um, registration? The, just speak to that issue. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, the, the, of course, the being a law, uh, it, it provides for provision. It has provisions around if you do not comply, then there are penalties. Okay. So uh, say a, a data subject uh, or the owner of the data takes a complaint about an organization to the data commissioner uh, and the data commissioner evaluates uh, that, uh, you know, that complaint and determines that the company is actually in the wrong, they have broken the law. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the penalties uh, in Kenya, the penalties are quite um, not too bad. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, the penalties I think are up to three million shillings mm -hmm. uh, for, you know, for uh, for breaking the particular types of, uh, of the requirements mm -hmm. uh, or jail term. Mm -hmm. uh, and that accountability is given to the top management of an organization. Mm -hmm. And that is, uh, when you look at that uh, wait, penalty. Wait, yes. the, the penalty, it's, it's the management that will be charged. Definitely. The, re the responsibility for breaking the law as far as data protection is concerned, mm -hmm. it normally rests with the top management. Most likely, the top manage will, management will be defined as the CEO. Mm -hmm. And that is why when uh, the same Data Protection Act talks about uh, the data protection officers. Mm -hmm. So for large organizations, they are going to be advised to have uh, to, to, to appoint data protection officers who can be able to advise them. Mm -hmm. The reason I mention this is that uh, if there is going to be a breach of the law, mm -hmm. it is not the data protection officer who is mm -hmm. going to be accountable. Mm -hmm. It is the organization. Yes. It is the organization through the top management. Mm -hmm. And who is the top management? Probably the CEO of the company. Mm -hmm. So the CEO of the company is going to have a very, very close uh, engagement with the data protection officer so that they can make sure 
that the company is following the requirements of the law mm. regarding data protection. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very, very useful information, actually. I just feel like we could spend the rest of the of mm. the time just discussing that. But, uh, mm. you know, the interview section, that's it uh, mm. from the interview section. Uh, thank you so much for gracing uh, Take on Tech. Mm. Uh, we look forward to inviting you again to still continue breaking down this issue of data compliance. Uh, that's it from our interview section of Take on Tech, uh, where we were looking at uh, privacy and data compliance for organizations. Please continue following us on our social media handles, and that's at KBC Channel One across all our handles. My name is Grace Gidaiga. Keep watching. We have gotten to the Innovators Club and here we bring you different technological innovations and in some days like today we challenge you to try something new by trying out a DIY at home which you can do with minimal resources. Check out what we have for you today.
draw the curtains on today's show, but we still welcome your interaction and participation on our social media handles in the question that we have asked you today that is what sector in kenya do you feel needs technological innovations to be invested in it in order to advance the hashtag to use is tech on tech at kbc channel one my personal handle where you can interact with me is at stephanie underscore ayeta that is on instagram and stephanie ayeta across all other social media handles how about we meet next week, same time, same place. Until then, let's keep it tech. Adios.